So, so we have Sean here. Uh, Sean has been one of those people who's been pr pursuing this cross-continental uh, crypto Tefra thing for for a little while now, and. Uh, Glacier Peak I actually spent some time poking around with that a number of years ago. So this 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 is good. Yeah. From from looking at the size of the sort of the proximal on some of these, it's like, well, it has to be over there. Of course it is. So so now you found it. <laughs> okay. Hello everybody. So I'd like to uh, talk a bit about some work I've been doing to trace the extent of the Glacier Peak Tefer, shown here in red to a number of lake sites in the uh, eastern seaboard. These are lake glacial lake sites. And also to see how this contributes to, oh, thanks. I was wondering what was going on with that. Yeah. Oh, it needs to be, there, we go. there you go, thanks. <laughs> and how this contributes to a developing Tefra stratigraphy in the region based, based on, hello? One, two, testing, testing, yeah, okay. <laughs> And how this, how this uh, contributes to uh, developing TEFA stratigraphy in the region based on crypto TEFAs. So I have a number of co-workers on this project. These are Les Swinner and Jesse Vincent at the University of New Brunswick and Dwayne Fraser, sorry, Dwayne Fraser at University of Alberta. I only learned the other day that's how his name is supposed to be pronounced. So I'll begin with a bit of background detail about how I started, uh, how, I, how I initially became involved with this project, with this, with this work and then move on to some uh, descriptions of these sites and what I found in them. So this work started for me several years ago when I was involved with this project called PRECIP, which is Paleo Reconstructions of Ocean Atmosphere Coupling in Peat. And this project studied a transect of ombotrophic bogs along the eastern seaboard, and the aim was to reconstruct the Holocene paleo environments through a range of multi-proxy techniques such as plant macrofossils, testate amoeba, and stable isotopes. And these should all record the influences of a number of key climate drivers, such as thermohaline circulation. Age control at the sites was by radiocarbon, and I was just asked to assess the feasibility of um, uh, using TEFA technology in age control, which I did by starting at this site here on Newfoundland called Norden's Pond Bog. So this just sets the geographical scene for the uh, for the region, and it shows, you can see how it relates to a number of major volcanic source areas. So the nearest volcanic source area is Iceland and Jan Mayen, 2,700 to 3,400 kilometers to the northwest. Cascades and Alaskan sources are some five to 6,000 kilometers to the west, and Kamchatka up here is 8,000 kilometers away. So given these distances from volcanic source areas, I was a bit skeptical at first about the possibility of finding any um, usable or applicable um, TEFRA concentrations. I thought it might just be random background. But when I looked in the site, I found that there's up to a dozen crypto TEFRA layers, several of which, like these ones here, must have derived from fairly large magnitude events. The average shard size is about 30 to 40 microns. So that's not too small to get some useful um, analyses out of. This, for example, shows beam damage on the shards from uh, a, th a three micron beam, which is the Edinburgh setup um, that uh, Chris Hayward uses. Um, you can probably also get a five micron beam on some of these larger shards, um, but I would be doubtful if you could get much result out of a 10 micron beam. Uh, for example, uh, this three micron beam works quite well. I was a bit uh, skeptical about that um, hit there on that very long spine like shard, but that was a successful analysis. Um, you can also get multiple hits on some of these. Uh, that one there didn't come out above, I think that was about 94%, so we just nudged the, nudged the probe down a bit and um, a, few, a few microns, and that came out above 95. So you can get multiple hits on some of these. So the tephras we found at the site are all rhyolitic, and they'll come from some fairly distinct uh, volcanic areas. So you have the White River ash from Mount Churchill here in um, Alaska. They were from Mount St. Helens, from Newbury, and the Mazama ash from Crater Lake. So I've labeled the uh, 
the uh, correlated tephras here. And you can see uh, that and, and there's a number of uh, smaller layers that we analyzed here, but we couldn't um, correlate to anything at the time. A lot of this is fairly random um, geochemistry, so it's just background as well. I've included on this, the in blue, the radiocarbon age model, which I can also now replace with an age model in red, which is this, uh, derived from the ages of the tephras in publications. So that's a fairly good way of um, uh, verifying that your age model is correct at, at the site. So that's all very well for uh, Holocene and uh, for Holocene tephras in uh, Myers and Boggs. What about um, if we can push the chronology further backwards into the Lake Glacial using Lake Glacial lake sites in the same way as is done in a number of European sites? This is the work of Shuan Davies, where she's compiled a number of um, plume distribution maps for major volcanic uh, events coming out, of, coming out of Iceland. You can see here in the early Holocene, there's the Saxonvarten and Sudavoy and Aska S layers. In the uh, stadial and interstadial, there's the Veda Ash, the LST, the NYT, and the Borobol and the Penifila Tefra. Are there applicable? Are there, are there similar tephras um, at this age which we can find in the eastern seaboard uh, lakes? So I got in touch with Les Swinar and Jesse Vincent in New Brunswick, and they work all throughout this area on Lake Glacial Lakes. And I went to subsample um, material from two lakes in uh, Nova Scotia, Thin Ice Pond and Vino Lake, and one in Maine called Crocker Pond. And at the time, we speculated about the possibility of finding this tephra, the Glacier Peak, which I've marked here in uh, green and blue. It seemed like a good prospect. But of course, the Glacier Peak, it, uh, we call it the Glacier Peak tephra, but it's actually a number of uh, eruptions during what I suppose you can call a, an eruptive episode, uh, which are bookended by two, the two largest and most widespread eruptions, which are the G and B. There's another one of these nonsensical um, alphabet systems that's, that's been used. Um, so the two lighters are the G and the B. This is from Steve's paper uh, from 2009, where they compiled together, um, uh, where they um, redefined the uh, fallout areas from these, from these two uh, tephras, the G and the B. So looking in the sites, this is what I found. Um, in the middle of the stadial, uh, sorry, in the middle of the interstadial, there's a fairly distinct tephra layer, which I've uh, marked with this yellow uh, line. Uh, I should point out that this, the, the red is the loss and ignition curve. Um, if you look more closely in Vino Lake and Crocker Pond, you can see in the inset boxes here, which are higher magnification, higher detail, you can see the distributions are actually divided into uh, couplets, so there's an upper and a lower couplet to each of these. There's only one layer, however, in Thin Ice Pond. Uh, and in Crocker Pond, the couplets are so, um, are, you, can, you can almost say that they, these are separate layers rather than being a, a couplet in the true sense. In Vino Lake, I tested this um, stratigraphic bimodality on the basis of shards per cubic centimeter at one centimeter stratigraphic res resolution and shards per gram at half centimeter, half a centimeter re um, resolution. And you can see it, uh, it's, re it's reproducible using various methods. So we speculated that this was perhaps the Glacier G and B tephras. And to test this hypothesis, I uh, prepared separate ge geochemical samples for the upper and lower um, peaks in Crocker Pond and Vino Lake. So I, I, I prepared one, two, three, four, and then five separate geochemistry stubs, only a single stub for um, the nice pond. And the, <coughs> the idea was to try and reproduce the methodology that Steve used in his paper, where uh, he found that um, rather than just being uh, all the same chemistry, you can actually discriminate between at least the G and the B 
uh, layers on the basis of a, a number of major oxides. So B has more iron and calcium and less potassium than G. And also you can use certain um, major oxide ratios, so potassium iron versus calcium, potassium calcium versus iron. But this trick only really works if you do the proximal reference and distal samples probed at the same time within the same calibration period to avoid issues of slight differences between calibration periods. So again, I went back to the Edinburgh microprobe, and uh, these are the initial results on a, on a TAS plot, total, al total alkali silica TAS plot. And you can see it's a rhyolite. And uh, on the basis of these elements, there's no real separation between the various layers. It's a fairly, fairly uh, compact cluster. But applying the uh, technique that Steve used, uh, I, I should say that I also used the same GBM proximal reference stub on the Edinburgh probe that Steve had in his paper. And so, of course, it produces a similar split on the G and the B uh, layers. So he goes from about um, 1.2 to 1.4% calcium. But is there any distal geochemical affinity with the uh, East Coast layers? We're well, starting with Thin Ice Pond. You can see that in the, the blue squares here. They predominantly plot within the B envelope and relatively little or none within the G envelope. And this probably reflects the fact that there was just a single layer deposited at this site, uh, with little or no G being, being uh, li little or no layer G being deposited. At Vino Lake, uh, the lower and upper couplets do cluster together, but not necessarily within the proximal reference uh, samples. And at Crocker Pond, the, um, there's, there's no clear clustering. It looks more, more random um, and so on. So if there is any stratigraphic preservation within these lakes, it's not necessarily reflected in uh, geochemical uh, preservation. There's possibly a number of factors to explain this. I was talking with John the other day on the, on, on the, on the, uh, the field trip, and we were talking about why they don't neatly fall out into the same in the same pattern as uh, seen in Steve's paper. And it may be that, that these initial uh, eruptive materials have a slightly different chemistry from that which is deposited in the local area. Uh, but it may reflect also that there's um, an admixture of previous material uh, from, uh, from previous eruptions which is incorporated into it as well. So there's more stuff to think about with that. So moving on to the dating of, uh, of the layer. Again, Steve, in his paper, compiled together a number, of, um, a number of the best dates that they could find in the literature. And using a Bayesian um, model, uh, they uh, found a probability distribution from the model age of the tephra between uh, 13,700 and 13,400 um, calibrated years BP, which is about 400 radiocarbon years older than a number of previous estimates. So I've plotted that on this graph here, the, the red error bar, labeled it proximal. And that compares quite well with the on-peak ages of the tephras at Thin Ice Pond and Vino Lake. The green and the blue are the upper and lower couplets. Uh, this is using a, an Oxcal model, a P-sequence Bayesian Oxcal model. There's a bit of an issue, however, with the Crocker Pond ages. They're, they come out several hundred years younger with the age model. Um, that has yet to be explained. I'd appreciate if anybody has any ideas about why ages are younger rather than being older, etc. Um, also on here, I've plotted the, um, the extent of the archaeological Clovis complex, just for comparison. Uh, the, the, in this sort of data may have applications in archaeology. Uh, so I said there's the loss and addition curves, and the blue curve here is the oxygen oxygen-18 curve from the N-grip core for comparison with any major oscillations that um, you can see in the uh, LOI curve. So while I was sampling for the late glacial material in uh, Thin Ice Pond, I also sampled up through the core to the mid, sort of early mid um, Holocene region. See if I can find any of those same tephras uh, that I found in the Newfoundland core. 
And I did find this cluster of tephras up here. There's one very large tephra layer up to uh, well, more than 5,000 shards per cubic centimeter. Above that, there's a layer with up to um, four, almost 400 shards per cubic centimeter. And above that, a much smaller layer with about 80 shards per cubic centimeter. And I wondered if it was possible to correlate these across to the Newfoundland stratigraphy. So I'll just expand this region of the stratigraphy here in this slide and start and uh, describe this, this layer here at 346 centimeters. You see the shards are um, quite uh, large, up to 100 microns in the long axis. They're fairly elongate, a number of them uh, fluted or ribbed, uh, and with a number of vesicles in, in some of them. And taking these to the microprobe, it found they're predominantly, right, they are, well, almost entirely rhyolitic. Um, I haven't included biplots for all the other uh, major elements, but I've looked at them, and this is, a, uh, this is spot on for the Mzama ash. So now, we, yes, we can correlate between these various sites using the Mzama ash. Moving up to the 323 centimeter layer, this is a very different looking shard morphology. It has a distinctly, peculiarly green looking color. Uh, they're, they're fairly rounded, um, very vesicular, some of them, almost pumicey, and full, full of inclusions, these, uh, especially on this shard you can see, full of these microlytic inclusions. Almost to the extent that some of them look like a collection of inclusions just held together with a bit of glass in some cases, rather than the other way around. And looking at the chemistry, it's a day site, and it has a peculiarly low uh, potassium content, which I'll show on, on this graph here. It's about 1%, which gave me problems when trying to correlate this with any North American or um, Icelandic material. Um, it wasn't until I stumbled across this paper here by Breitzever et al., which describes, uh, uh, describes marker layers in Kamchatka that I found anything remotely similar to it. So Kamchatka, they divide the tephras into low, medium, and high um, potassium content. Uh, the Eastern Front, in particular, has low potassium content. So I contacted Vera Ponomareva and Maxim Portniagin, who work with these uh, tephras, and they confirmed it was this one, the KS2 or SUDAC2 eruption, which has an age of about um, 7,000 years to 6,700 cal years BP. So we should have a look at Kamchatka. It's, uh, it's home to about 37 large volcanoes and calderas, including the Sudak caldera, which is marked here. Uh, and while we're here, we should, we should probably also give a mention to the Kurile Islands, which is the chain of volcanoes extending downwards, which has a large number of, of uh, volcanic sources, such as Sarichev volcano, seen erupting here in 2009. So that's uh, moving on to the 317 centimeter layer. I thought initially this was just a bit of reworking from the layers below. Um, but when I looked more closely at the shard morphology, I could see that it was different again, from, especially from this stuff. But it was not like the Mazama ash. So I thought that perhaps it was another uh, event that needed to be examined. So back to the microprobe. And this time, it's predominantly a uh, it is predominantly a day site, but much higher with the silica. Oh, sorry, uh, much higher with the potassium than compared with the sudac. I've not found anything yet to um, correlate this with. Um, perhaps it um, has a distinctive iron content, which is quite high. That could be useful in correlation. Something that did catch my eye was this um, study by Turner et al. Um, this is uh, a number of tephras examined uh, in the South Yukon around the White River area, where they found this thing in the, the green triangles, which they call the snag tephra. And I've overlaid the unknown 317 layer on here. Um, it's a, an approximate um, correlation. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not exact. But this stuff there is. Uh, I mean, I step stage five, so obviously this not, it's not that, but it could be a pointer to an approximate source area, possibly Alaskan. Um, we don't know yet. 
So I'm going to give it a name for now, um, uh, a preliminary name. Um, uh, I'm going to call it the Thin Ice Pond Tephra. I'd estimate its age at about 6,600 years. This is based on the accumulation rate between Zama and Sudak. So the picture so far for um, uh, the uh, Tefra stratigraphic framework in the region is that we can correlate between uh, Maine and Nova Scotia using the Glacier Peak. We can also correlate between uh, that region and <coughs> back to uh, Newfoundland using the Mazama ash. Something I noticed when I was doing this initial work in Newfoundland was this big gap, this, this absence of tephra deposition below the Mazama ash. And I wondered if this was unique to that site or it was um, telling us something about atmospheric depositional processes and how far down it extended in the stratigraphy. But you can see now a similar pattern at Thin Ice Pond below the Mazama. There's an absence of tephra deposition all the way down to the Glacier Peak which suggests that perhaps there is a 6,000 year long hiatus in ash deposition being caused by something. Whether it's atmospheric reorganization or something like this, the Laurentide Ice Sheet, um, which even all, all throughout the interstadial period is melting back, it's diminishing, but it's still a fairly sizable presence all throughout this period. So it may well be influencing the local environment. So uh, perhaps there's a high pressure system present on, on, on the ice sheet, which is uh, sending winds outwards and southwards, deflecting um, material away from, from our east coast sites here. So there's a number of missing events as well, which we need to keep an eye out for. Um, there's an over up to 1912 eruption. So there should be a big peak in Tefra at the uh, top of a number of these stratigraphies. There's the Bridge River Ash and the Dusty Creek Tephra, uh, another Glacier Peak event. Uh, there's the Aleutian Arc um, calderas. There's nine calderas which are formed during the Holocene. And there's any number of Tephras coming out of the uh, many volcanoes in Kamchatka. One event to look out for is Kural Lake, which was the largest volcanic eruption of, uh, uh, from Kamchatka, which produced up to 170 kilometers, uh, cubic kilometers of ejecta. And another one is the event at Sudak, which followed Sudak 2, Sudak 1, which produced up to 19 cubic kilometers of uh, ejector. And I've only heard today that this might have been found, actually. Somebody uh, that we know is, who's working in the region might well have found that today. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much. I should also uh, have new orders from Britta to give a shout out for uh, uh, geology paper. Um, Jensen et al. 2014 describing the link between White River ash and uh, the 860, 860B Tefla. <laughs> so new, uh, new distributions, new chemistry, new sites, etc. So have a, have a look on geology. It should be out any day now. I'm a bit embarrassed to ask this question, but what's exactly the definition of a shard? Is it a size characteristic? Is it a morphological description? It, I mean, clearly it has to just be glass, but what is the actual definition of a shard? It's never occurred to me to think what the <laughs> definition is. It's, um, mm, yeah, a broken piece of glass, I suppose. Um, so it can really it's, be any it's, size? I suppose it's because it is glass. You talk about, shard, you talk about shards of glass. But you wouldn't describe um, an alpha bowl as a shard or so on. So, yeah, yeah. So I suppose it is. I suppose it is something peculiar to the glass phase of of, of, of the tephra, um, rather than the other minerals and so on. Um, so it's a morphological description. Yes. Yeah. I'd say so. Yeah. 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 I noticed in one of your cores you had the Augustine layer G. You had the unit G in oh, yeah. one of the. So. Um, in the outcrop that I'm studying as we speak now, it's only about four centimeters thick, and that's about 50 kilometers east of Augustine Island. Yeah. So I think it's pretty interesting that we usually think of cat, you know, we think of these Mazama ashes being found in Newfoundland that 50 kilometers due east, it's four centimeters, and yet you're seeing it correlated in a Newfoundland core. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think you can get lucky possibly. with this as well. It depends on what the weather's doing in the day. 
Um, so what? So many have... elements of luck are involved as well. It's, not, you... it's not just magnitude. So magnitude, size, the eruption helps. But if the wind just happens to be going in the right direction that day, it's, that also helps as well. And um, what age did you get for that unit? Uh, there was um, sorry, uh, 13, 4 to 13, 6. Was, uh, 13, around that. 700, 13, 400. Yeah, around that. Yeah. It's not G. I find we got some G data, and it's not G. What is that? What is that? What is that? I just, that, that East Lake Tefra one, I, 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 I'm kind of fond of Newbury Wolf, you know. But East Lake Tefra, I don't know, 20 centimeters at 4 or 5 kilometers, and it's on the East Coast. It's not very big, but, but there was a lot of water. I wanted to ask you about those radio particles that were coming out. What was the material that you did? Uh, it would have been um, aquatic acoustic. Aquatic acoustic. Wait, wait, wait. I was actually pointing out that. Aquatic plants or terrestrial plants? I assume they, the person that would just less wouldn't know better than to um, take aquatic. So uh, I assume it's terrestrial. And is there any chance that the Tefra shards were somehow bioturbated down in the sediment column? I'm trying to think of all kinds of extraordinary circumstances to. <laughs> Come up with uh, reasons why the test will be delayed in the public catchment due to trapping ice, trapping snow moves, or something, and then deposited 300 years after the event was over. That's extraordinary. I think it's similar just to say the dates are wrong in some way, somewhere or another. Uh, those, um, there are some larger error um, factors on those dates, and they're from two to four centimeters of the certificate, whereas at the sites where they do line up and behave themselves, they're around. Um, one centimeter, half, half centimeter, you know, strategically. So maybe it's maybe it's loose. Yeah. You may have uh, you may have mentioned this, but uh, I'm not sure. Did are your reference samples of Glacier Peak and the other volcanoes? Did you analyze them separately? Uh, in other words, did you analyze them side by side? Side by side, yeah. So you had proximal material, right? Yeah. yeah. And then you had the, the material from the bog, and you analyzed them the, uh, and side and by side. And and did you try to match the sizes of the charts? The sizes? No, no. That's, that's a good point. Uh, I imagine, yes, yeah, the possible thing. Uh, <laughs> Just wondering. Thank you. This wouldn't actually be the first first case of sort of ambiguous. There's a small place actually in the, the, the paper it did go back you know, to one and others. There's this, one of these places in Idaho where this one where it's, it's just really ambiguous. Yeah, yeah. Um, 